So, and he was actually abandoned when he was one. I mean, so he'll make comments like, well, I don't even know that woman. You know, I don't care about her. Oh my gosh. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related. Real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. We're back. (laughs) The other day I went to the mailbox and there is a postcard. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those old timey things people used to send. (laughs) Old timey things. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's rare that you get a postcard nowadays, right? Um, Yeah, actually. It is, unless it's somebody wanting something. Yeah. So what are your, I mean, I know I'm taking this down a different trail here, but. Oh, Lord. What are your feelings on getting postcards nowadays? It makes me happy. That's what I was about to say. I've noticed that when you get postcards now or greeting cards, people tend to view them differently than they used to. They mean more now, I think, than they used to mean because people don't typically take the time to do it anymore. Right. They're more personable. Yeah. Well, there was this thing on Shark Tank. You know, I watch too much Shark Tank, but they would send postcards with your pictures. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that one of the sharks didn't like about it was the note that you could send on the postcard was typed. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if you could just use a script font, it would look better because people like to see handwritten type things sometimes. Yeah. Well, there's actually, and I'm not going to say the name of the service because, you know, I don't have any way to verify what they're doing now. But I know that there is a card service that you can use that you can actually um, send in samples of your handwriting. They, you know, they make you write the alphabet a bunch of times and then it creates your handwriting uh, for the postcard. So you can type whatever you want, but it puts it in what your handwriting would look like. Pretty cool. Yep. So anyway, I get this postcard and I'm like, what is this? Because usually the only postcards we get are some kind of, you know, talking about your car insurance warranty or something. Like all the phone (laughs) calls. a car we don't have anymore. (laughs) Yeah. All the phone calls you get. And it says, David and Lori, we're on date night in Naples, Florida. While the kids are at home fending for themselves. (laughs) (laughs) When we got our bill, they gave us this postcard. They said they mail it for us. Of course. Yeah, of course, you both came to mind. When you get this, let us know. Then we'll send you a picture of all the desserts we ordered. (laughs) Ha ha. (laughs) Love you guys. I'm not going to say their name because they may not want me to say their name. They may want me to say their name, but I'm not going to because this is private. And then hashtag nacho vacation. (laughs) Well, they have the kids there, right? Yeah, but they're saying that's nacho, not our vacation. That's right. their vacation. It, yeah, exactly. But I'm so proud of them because this is a couple we've been working with and they need date nights. Everybody needs date nights, mm-hmm. but they especially need date nights because of their schedules. They hardly see each other. Yeah. So I am so proud of them that not only are they sticking to the date nights, but they're doing it on vacation. Well, I'm proud of them. I'm also worried about them. Oh, Lord. Because of all the people in your life to think about to send a card to, you think of me and Lori on your date night. (laughs) Well, look, they love us. I know. I know. I'm just poking at them. I just think that's funny. Yep. And I love the nacho vacation. Yeah. Man, I wish I had thought about getting cards when we were on vacation the other week. Oh, gosh. So let's talk about our vacation. Oh, goodness. So as most of you know, our vacations are a lot calmer than they used to be because my four kids... Uh, have moved out and moved on to the uh, latter years of their life, which is which is fun the because latter years of their life. You make it sound like they're eighty. They're eighty. <laughs> I'm 120. Yeah. Um, so no, they're the triplets are now 21, and and my oldest is um, he'll be 23 next month. Mm-hmm. So they're they're moving on, and uh, we're getting to enjoy the. Fun part of now they're asking us for all types of feedback and information of what would you do? And, you know, all those years where you try to influence them with your um, look outlook on life Wisdom. and what you should do. Yeah. All that, but, you know, they weren't very interested then. Now they're like asking 
all the time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we go on vacation. We go to Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, a number of things we wanted to do, we couldn't do because we find out too late that you had to have like a 30 day advanced. Well, a lot uh, of things had just reopened mm-hmm. and they were limiting the number of people that could come in because of the whole COVID crap. And tickets were only available, you know, like 40 days out. And you could even get those. And then some of them hadn't reopened yet. Like, we, I wanted to go to the Smithsonian Air, whatever thing. Yeah, space and Air. All yeah, and you wanted to go to the Natural History one. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go to the Holocaust Museum. We didn't get to do any of that. But we stayed busy. Don't get us wrong. <laughs> yeah, we did stay busy. We went to the zoo. <laughs> All right. So if you live in Washington, D.C., I'm sorry, but you have a horrible zoo. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> the animals apparently didn't realize they were reopened after COVID because we couldn't find any. I think we saw three or four. I saw a bear, the seals. Yeah. And there was some kind of kangaroo jackrabbit looking thing. Yeah. And a. <laughs> Oh, and the um, little weasel things. The, yeah, the groundhog things. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they were. And well, then a bird. Okay. Well, so, to be fair, to be fair, there were some indoor uh, portions to go into, like the rainforest portion or whatever. But the, the line was ridiculously long. Yeah. You had to wait in line for like an hour to walk through a 10 minute thing. And it was hot that day. We yeah. had good weather, but it was still hot that day. But they also had things like, like you were looking in the thing going, I, I don't see an animal anywhere. It's an outdoor opening. Mm-hmm. Like, where's the animal at? Yep. <laughs> and one of them we even saw where it said this, you know, the animal has been, has been removed or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I guess he went on vacation. I don't know. Yeah. But um, it was, it was the weirdest thing. I walk around the zoo and I'm like, where are, oh, we did see an elephant. Uh, that's one, what I was going to say. One elephant. We, we saw, saw one elephant. elephant. Um, I was like, it's the weirdest thing. It's like a zoo with no animals. It was like a ghost town zoo. We <laughs> but there, was a, but we, there were a bunch of people there. I know. We laugh because we see more animals in our yard. <laughs> we, we do. Than we see at the zoo. <laughs> so we're going to open tickets up to to come to our yard <laughs> yeah. to view the wildlife. Sim Zoo. Hey, maybe we can get your kids to come back. Uh, they will soon enough, in, I'm sure. Put them in cages. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. The Sim Zoo. <laughs> it was it? a zoo when everybody was here. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we do like we have we have rabbits and deer and coyote and a raccoon and, yeah, you know, we don't have giraffes and elephants yet, but <laughs> we do have a lot of wildlife in, in the yard. That's for sure. So that was very interesting. Yeah. And we, oh, and then y'all, the lime scooters. Oh, my gosh. That so was they had these scooters story. and my son wanted to ride them. So we're like, OK. And rather than walking 45 minutes again in the heat, we decided, oh, we'll try the Lime Scooters. Y'all, don't do it. (laughs) Or learn more about it before you do. It's a trick. It's a trick. We got on it. We were able to ride 45 feet. Then they cut off. And then they would get them going again for a minute and cut them off. We spent more time pushing the stupid things than we did riding them. And finally, we're like, you know, forget this. We go to drop them, and so I go onto the um, app to end our thing. Oh, no, you can't drop them there. <laughs> yeah, you got to take them half a mile back <laughs> to where you were. Right. To, to, in order to stop being charged for them. Right. So apparently there's red zones you can't ride in. Which, according to Jackson, you don't know that until you pay for it. <laughs> right. There's apparently, too, some red zones... It looks like you're not in the red zone on their map, but it's still not working. Yeah, like, like the GPS is off on them a little yeah, bit. So yeah, so needless to say, maybe it was just the Lime ones, but um, that was not enjoyable. Dude. We were extremely frustrated. And then Jackson got his to work, and ours wouldn't work. <laughs> and we're in the same place. It, <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. That, very frustrating. Yeah. So we said, forget this, and called an Uber. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did. And the Uber was fine. Yeah. But we did see some pretty things and we had a good time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. It was worth the trip. 
Well, I will say from now on, when I schedule the vacation, I will ask y'all when y'all <laughs> want to come back. What did you think about the Potomac trip, though? We didn't talk about that. The Potomac trip? Yeah. The like, boat? Yeah, like we had a boat ride up up and down the Potomac. I don't know, probably, what, a mile? It was up 45 and, minutes. Yeah, a mile up, mile back, maybe. Um, I just thought there'd be more to it. I was like, this is just a boat ride. Like, the only thing we saw that was of any real interest was like an old fort right there at the turnaround part where yeah. we turned around yeah. and come back. But you're seeing it from 500 yards away. But, you know, I guess the only other thing was, hey, look, on this side, there's Maryland. On this side, well, that Virginia. Well, that was through Mount Vernon. <laughs> they have other Potomac taxis and stuff that you can do. Okay. So maybe it was just because it was Mount Vernon. It was so short and whatever. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway. I did like George Washington's residence. Yes. That was that was very interesting. Yep. But if we ever go back, we will be staying in Virginia instead of D.C. Because we went to Virginia and it just seemed like a better place. Where, yeah, where were we? In Alexandria. Yeah. And cool. now when we, D.C., we stayed like a block from the Capitol. Mm-hmm. So we were really close to everything. And it was cool. Don't get me wrong. But um, the place we stayed was an Airbnb. And we stayed like in the bottom part of this <laughs> people's house. <laughs> and on the... Airbnb listing, it says, we have children, so every once in a while, you may hear the pitter-patter of their feet. No. (laughs) It's like a freaking gymnasium above your head. We kept hearing, do-do-do-do-do-do, boom. Yeah. Do-do-do-do-do-do, And and I'm not saying, it wasn't just every once in a while you'd hear it. It was freaking 7 o'clock in the morning, because they (laughs) went to bed at at 10 o'clock at night. (laughs) But thankfully, apparently, they went somewhere a couple of days before we left, and it was so peaceful. Yeah, that was funny. It was almost like my kids were back home because they stayed upstairs. Well, I asked Jackson, I said, is it bothering you? He said, no, I live with that with the brothers. Yeah. Yeah, because they would, you know, wrestle and fight and and uh, made a lot of noise. Walk like elephants. Yeah. And I was like, you don't understand, even though you're at the other end of the house, when you jump off your bed and hit the floor, you know, everybody in the house hears it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes you feel it. Yep. But anyway, all in all, it was a good trip. Um, you know, so for those of you who are who are going on vacation, taking your kids, taking your stepkids, you know, take it in stride, enjoy mm-hmm. yourself. Believe it or not, you will make memories, whether they're good or bad. Yep. <laughs> well, we got you, some memories. But you will make some memories. Stupid lime scooters. <laughs> All right, David, let's talk about our guest today. All right, who's that? Our guest today is Adrian. Hey, Adrian. Adrian. Yo, Adrian. <laughs> She's been blending seven years, married almost seven years, full-time stepmom to stepson 12, stepson 14, stepdaughter 17. Her bio son is 14, and she has 50-50 with her bio son. He goes to his dad's every other week. Okay. Lots of teenagers. Yes. The hardest part of blending for her was having stepkids more than her own bio kid. Mm-hmm. I feel you, sister. Yep. And we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. How Jackson would go to his dad's every other weekend, and I'm like, I miss my baby. And David's like, I don't really care because mine have been gone a week. Yeah. He didn't say that. But, I didn't say it, but I felt it. Right. And I didn't even think about me saying it that, you know, that's kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Irresponsible. No. <laughs> um, non empathetic. Cruel and unusual no, punishment. That's that's not very I wasn't thinking about David and being compassionate towards what he goes through. Yeah. There's there's things that we're able to talk about now that we couldn't back then because we were going through some some rough patches. But um yeah, the, I didn't I didn't take it too well when she would talk about how much she missed her kid that was only gone for forty eight hours basically. Well, that's my baby. Every two weeks. And I'm like Dude, I would I would pay to only give up forty eight hours every two weeks. But um, and the other thing too is you have to deal with the fact that um, if you're not careful, you start just being resentful because the the kids hear more than your kid. Mm -hmm. And and it's not that it's not that you have anything against the kid, but you have resentment toward them for what they represent. Right. And then from Jackson's standpoint, 
he was, you know, a stepbrother to four kids every other week and an only child every other week. Yeah. Now I have to say, I, I never saw my kids display any emotion toward Jackson because he got to spend more time with me than they did. No. So I'm they glad, mean I'm glad of that. Anyway. We, we do see that happen. What was that? So they were just mean to him all the time anyway. Yeah. They were consistently mean. Um, that's just the way they bond. They mean each other. <laughs> that's how most kids bond. They still mean to each other. And honestly, they like it that way. But anyway, um, we, we do see that often where the biological kids resent the stepkid because they get the parent more often. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we didn't have to go through that. Right. One of the things that we talk about in this podcast with, or that I talk about in this podcast with Adrian is food issues. I'm not going to go into it, mm-hmm. but step families, my families have food issues too. But I would say food issues rank up definitely in the top 10 of step family issues. I was thinking top five. but I yeah. was thinking top five and I said, <laughs> no, wait a minute. Let me back it down. It might be number six. Because <laughs> we hear that quite frequently. Yes. And we dealt with it. We went through it. Yeah. We've got everything from... Uh, a mac and cheese fetish to my waffles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We're ending on that note. <laughs> All right, David, do your spiel. All right. So uh, let's get to listening to this interview with Adrian. But before we do that, here's a word about the Nacho Kids Academy. There is a way to save your sanity and your relationship, and it's called the Nacho Kids Academy. In the Nacho Kids Academy, you will learn the skills and knowledge to properly nacho, techniques to handle step family challenges, ways to improve your communication, and much, much more. Visit NachoKidsAcademy.com and sign up today to join other step parents who are seeing the life changing benefits of nachoing. Again, that's NachoKidsAcademy.com. Today we have stepmom Adrian. Hey, Adrian, how are you? Good. How are you? Doing good. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been blending? Uh, Yes, we're coming up on seven years. So seven years ago, we started dating. And then our seven-year wedding anniversary will be in September. Okay, so you got married fairly quickly. Yes, so there's a, a little bit of a story behind that. So I've actually known my husband for, I think it's 23 years. I met him when I was 18. And I actually met him through my ex-husband. Okay. Um, They were, they worked together. And then actually my husband now, he worked with my sister as well. So I've known him a long time. He's been a friend of the family. And, and so we, since we've known each other that long, we've kept in touch. We married other people, had kids with other people, and then we got divorced from those people. We reconnected and then we got married. Wow. So how many stepkids do you have? I have three stepkids. So I have stepdaughter, 17. I have a stepson who is 14. And then I have another stepson who is 12. And then I also have a bio son who is 14. So similar age to the middle stepson. Four teenagers. Yes, practically. I mean, I count the 12 year old as a teen. Yes, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like four teenagers in my house. Yes. What's the visitation schedule like? Well, for my bio son, he is 50-50. So every other week, week on, week off. And then with my stepkids, they are full time. Uh, they don't even have supervised visitation with their mother. So essentially, I see my stepkids more than my own biological child. And that's got to be hard. It's very hard. It's hard on me. It's hard on my biological kid. And not to dismiss the stepkids, I I think it's very hard on them to not have any contact with their mom. Right. What's the issue with her? Well, we can go backwards a little bit. So I think the time frame is about 10, 11, 10 or 11 years ago. They were living in another state and she decided she didn't really want to be married anymore. So she moved out of that state and 
at the time, my husband got full custody, but with supervised visitation, but she never exercised those rights. I don't know if it was because they were states away or she was busy doing other things. I'm not sure what was going on there, but now we all live in the same state and she has had access to them, but it's a choice. She makes that choice to not see them, not call them for their birthday, not bring them presents for Christmas. It, it just feels like a choice. Now, I, I must add, she has three, we call them new kids from um, her most recent marriage. So she's busy taking care of three new kids while these three are pretty much abandoned. So she just chooses not to be a part of their life. Right. And I know we have some concerns about her mental health, but I mean, that's undiagnosed. We have no clue why any mother would, who's around would just choose not to be involved. I mean, I'm a biological mother and I could never picture myself giving up on my child like that. Yeah, I know. How long ago did she quit having contact with them? So she had moved out, like I said, like 11 years ago. And then they would go through about three year periods of time where they wouldn't hear from her at all. And back then she was paying child support. So yeah, they didn't hear from her, but the money was coming in. Right. Well, nowadays we don't hear from her and the money doesn't come in. So she's 30,000 plus behind in child support and the pandemic hasn't helped that. So she's basically been given a free pass to be uninvolved. Wow. That's got to be hard on her kids. It's interesting. Even though she's highly uninvolved, they still view her with lots of love. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the way that they speak about her or the way that they wonder about her, it's like she's a saint. And unfortunately, they know they know the truth about her and, and some of the things that she's done or not done. So it's really hard for them. It's, it's like a two, two-sided point of view. Like they have such great love for her, but they know the other side of her too. And that makes it even harder because you're seeing this woman walk away from her kids, but they still love her immensely. As a stepmom with an absent biological mother, it's really hard to know where to step in and where to step back. You know, the kids do need certain things from their mom, but it's not always my job to replace her or fill that hole either. Right. You can't fix what you didn't break. Exactly. So it's been kind of trial and error for me, like with the Nacho Kids method. At one point, I was super tempted to go Nacho Supreme, like I'm not doing anything for anybody. (laughs) But in a full-time situation, it's just impossible. Like I do have to step up in certain cases because there is that gap. But I had to be the one to decide what stressed me out and what was okay for me to step in and and give a helping hand or a, a listening ear or whatever they needed. Right. And we do have many full-time step parents that can fully nacho, but it's because of what causes them stress. Like you said, if you don't mind being there for them with certain things, then that's what you should do. If it causes you stress to think this little girl doesn't have a mom and I know she's got questions about things, am I just going to step back and let her approach me or am I going to reach out to her? That's the choice you have to make. Yes. And I had to learn that over time, like in the very beginning of my nacho journey, it was just like, you know, I don't, I don't want to do anything. Everything stresses me out. This is a disaster. And then, you know, as time came into play and I just started looking at things a little bit differently in my household, Mm -hmm. I started to see, well, she came to me with questions, but that doesn't stress me out. Like I, I feel kind of glad that she felt like she could turn to me or, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm just happy that they want some kind of connection with me. So right. I really had to decide 
what level of connection I, I want with everyone in the house. Mm -hmm. And then if it gets to the point that you realize it's stressing you out, then you can step back. Right. And there are still things in my house that really, really stress me out. And so those are still things that I nacho. And sometimes it does cause some hard feelings in the house. Like, why don't you want to cook us dinner tonight? Oh, dinner. <laughs> Everyone has had to come to terms with me not doing as much as I used to. And yes, dinner has been such a hot button topic in our house. Mm -hmm. It is in many houses. Yes. <laughs> you decided to nacho dinner, not all the time, but sometimes. And why did you choose to do that? So lots of reasons. I don't even know where to start. Food is just the worst in my house. So in my house, I have some food allergies. My son has some food allergies. My stepdaughter has chosen to be a vegetarian, which, okay, more power to you. But mm -hmm. I, I can't do that because of my food restrictions already. My husband is a fitness fanatic, so he loves all these diets here and there to try to look his best. And so with all of those different things going on in the house, food limits and, and so on, it's very hard to come up with meals that satisfy everyone's taste. Mm -hmm. And that really stressed me out. And then, you know, I was cooking five to seven days a week and it did bother me that, you know, nobody would appreciate it or say thank you. And everybody would just kind of grumble at the table and you know, one thing that five people liked, one person sat there and complained. So it just, it didn't feel good to me. Right. Cooking dinner all the time. Mm -hmm. So what do you know, do now? What did you decide to do to alter that? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, I have implemented a couple of takeout nights. So we have kind of a rotation of takeout food chains or restaurants that everybody can find something to their taste or their diet. Mm -hmm. um, so we do take out a couple of nights a week and everyone can choose what suits their diet. So that's the first thing. And I generally do those on days where like I've had a 12 hour day at work or, you know, husband is really busy. So just on those super busy days where I don't want to cook or clean, mm -hmm. then we just do take out. Uh, the second thing is I just basically cook what I think sounds good. And then whoever wants to eat it can eat it. And if you don't want to eat that for whatever reason, uh, there's some frozen meals. There's some quick and easy, you know, mac and cheese in the cupboard. So if you don't want to eat what I've fixed, you go fix something for yourself. That is great. Yeah. There was a third thing, but it, it slipped my mind. So. If, if it comes back to me, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know from talking to you in the past that your husband really wanted you to cook what everybody wanted. Has he kind of stepped back from that or calmed down, should I say? <laughs> he has. <laughs> he, he has sort of. So it's funny. I forget what it was. It was a couple weeks ago and I made pasta which my husband doesn't generally eat. He, he likes the low carb diet and his youngest son was on this kick as well. Well, I'm not going to eat pasta, right? Well, I fixed pasta. And then he had a plate in front of his son to eat. And his son just sat there with this look on his face. And I was like, what are you not going to eat? And and then my husband's response was, yeah, we're not running a restaurant here. We're not making five things. And I was like, wow, where was that comment three months ago? <laughs> we're not running a restaurant. Yeah, we're not. I am so happy to hear that. Yeah, so progress has been made. But, you know, there's still an occasion where it's like, oh, you made chicken? Well, so-and-so can't eat chicken. And I'm like, well, let's correct that. So-and-so chooses not to eat chicken. Mm -hmm. And we're not running a restaurant. Girl, I really am so impressed because I remember a conversation about soup. You had made soup. One of the kids didn't like something in the soup. And your husband told you to fix soup without whatever for the kid. Yes. 
you have a better memory than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's not good that I have such a good memory. I know. I, I'm a little bit sorry that you brought that up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It's okay. Um, I just had forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh, now you're going to be mad all day about it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You know me. I, I'm pretty easygoing. But yeah, the soup. Ugh. Well, ever since that moment, I was just like, oh, well, I'll just make the soup without the chicken, whatever. Like if it just keeps the peace, that's fine. You know, people can have their different toppings and, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not going to not cook what I'm hungry for just because of everybody else's opinions. Right. Because you can't cater to everybody, especially when you have food allergies and then diet restrictions. Yeah. Food has just been the, the toughest thing in our house. And it's it's evolved over time. You know, we didn't start off with all of these restrictions. The only thing that we did start off with was the food allergies, which that's the thing too, is I really notified my husband. Uh, this is, if you marry me, this is what's going on here. You know, I'm, I'm allergic to nuts. And then, um, so is my son. And then we have a couple other smaller allergies as well. So, you know, I warned him, this is what you're getting into. So mm -hmm. we, we don't eat peanut butter and jelly. We just, we don't even have that in the house. You can't, right? It's too risky. We shouldn't, but we do. And luckily we've had no, no major incidents. But in the very beginning of our marriage, up until maybe a year, year and a half ago, oh, we had so many issues with the peanut butter being left out. Um, youngest stepson would make like a peanut butter sandwich and then not eat it and then put it in the fridge like open. <laughs> and so we had so many battles over food mm -hmm. and just safety. And so I got some advice way back when and whenever the peanut butter was left out, I just threw it away. If if you, I'm giving them the privilege of having peanut butter in the house, which is something I would not have if I were single. Right. So if you can't take the extra five steps to the cupboard to put it away, then I'm going to throw it out. And so that caused a lot of heated argument. Oh, I'm sure. And I know that the people in the Facebook group will be like, I hear you, girl, throw it away, throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I know it seemed mean. And, and my husband was like, well, that's a waste of money. And I'm like, yeah, but if I have to go to the hospital or my son has to go to the hospital, that's like 500 plus dollars. Mm -hmm. So talk about waste of money. Like we're talking about people's health here. Yeah. And there's a big difference between talking about somebody's health and just being annoyed that your stepkid left out the peanut butter. Right. So we, we really had to come to terms with how do we balance this household where some people eat peanut butter and some people don't and some people can and some people cannot. So, you know, this is a situation where the stepkids really had to learn to consider others before themselves. And it has literally taken six years for this situation to improve. So now you don't have the peanut butter issues. Yeah, not really. Um, I haven't had to throw out a can of peanut butter probably in a year. <laughs> That's great. And again, let me just clarify for all the listeners. There is a difference in somebody having a food allergy and throwing away something versus somebody just being annoyed with the stepkids and throwing away something. Right. That, that is important to understand because, I mean, it's, it's a life and death thing for, for us. And so for me, you know, life and death is much bigger than, oh, he left out a, a candy wrapper. Right. Or he left out his Halloween candy on the couch. To me, it's much bigger than that. It could cost somebody their health and their life. And so uh, that is why I made the decisions I did. And it was just about setting better boundaries. like hey, if you really care about me, like you'll put the peanut butter away. It, it takes five seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know some stepkids that would intentionally probably smear peanut butter on your pillowcase. Yes, luckily, <laughs> that's not been the case. I mean, they really are 
sweet stepkids, but it's it's hard without a mom. They they haven't learned certain things that moms bring to the household, you know, like the nurturing aspect, the caring for other people. So I do see that, yeah, they're missing some of those social components that mothers help instill in children. So Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of that, they've never done anything vindictive in that way. That's good because you've seen the crazy stories in the Facebook group. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I have to tune those stories out. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you've kind of nacho dinners, not fully, but you've found a comfortable space for the dinners. So what other things do you nacho with the stepkids? So something else I nacho with the stepkids has been school. And this is kind of a funny one for me because I am a school teacher. And that makes it so much more difficult, doesn't it? I am the resident expert in everything school in our house. So, but I did have to step back because I I really felt it was my husband's responsibility to handle, you know, if, if a bad grade was coming home or a missing assignment or any any negative behavior concerns like I was just really tired of dealing with all that and husband was kind of a little bit clueless like oh I didn't know that happened or I had no idea this has been going on for five weeks so uh, this school year I pretty much relinquished all control of the grades I took their names off of the registration like I would just register all the kids together I took my name off of there as a contact. Just, I left my name as like an emergency. You know, if you can't get a hold of husband, yeah, sure, call me. But, but I gave up access to grades and that has really helped a lot. Do you feel like with your starting to nacho, helped your husband step up a little bit and to be more aware of this isn't a restaurant, we don't make five different meals kind of thing? I think in some ways, yes, he has definitely stepped up, has come to some realizations. But I mean, there's still room for improvement. So for example, like the cleaning of the house, there's not been very much stepping up there. But you know, I'll I'll take whatever little bit I can get at this point, because I came from a place where when I started nachoing, and I started setting boundaries, I mean, I didn't think we were going to make it. It it was the, mm-hmm. the level of arguments, the level of denial of this is a true problem that I'm taking on everybody else's stuff. Um, it just, it caused so many problems. But now the food stress has backed off, the school stress has backed off. So we have a, a couple things to work on. But I, I do think nachoing kind of helped shed light on how much I was really doing for everyone. Mm-hmm. And why you were burnt out. Definitely burnt out. And it, it's hard. You know, I, I work full time too. You know, it's not like I must stay at home anything. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes there's different seasons at my job that, that are more intense than others. And so with any life, it, it just needs to be balanced. And it wasn't balanced. It was like I was putting in my all at work, putting in my all at home for people who didn't always love or appreciate me. And so that was really, really challenging to try to find a better balance. So not showing really helped distribute the responsibilities a little bit better. How does your son get along with the stepkids? Ooh, good question. (laughs) (laughs) So they've been around each other since he was about seven. So, I mean, it's not terribly old, but not super young either. So kind of that middle age. And, you know, at first things were okay. Uh, They got along okay. You know, at that age, they play toys and, and different things, you know, how kids do games. Now that they're teens, whew, you know, everyone just wants to stay in their room and do their own thing. And, and there, there has been some definite conflict. And my son, it's hard on him because he does go back and forth. And so how do I explain this? Um, his dad's house, I'll just bring this up now. Um, his dad's house, he has now a live-in girlfriend. Okay. And um by the way, I've never met this woman. So she's like kind of a stepmom. They've been together seven or eight months. She lives there and she has three kids as well. So he has three 
step siblings on one side on his dad's side and then he has three step siblings on my side so that's a lot of relationships for an only child to really manage and so yeah he struggles with with getting along with everyone um there's pockets of good times sometimes we'll play a family game together but it's it's challenging. I'm not sure how he feels like he, each set of kids gets to see his actual parent more than he does. So I don't know if that's some hard feelings there or what, but does the living girlfriend have her kids full time? Actually, I think hers, it, it seemed like it was 80%, but now they've also gone to 50, 50, and then they've aligned it to our schedule. So now over at his dad's house, they have a week of no kids and then they have a week of all the kids. So I, I'm very jealous of that. <laughs> I know when David's kids were doing the week on, week off, I started paying attention more in Facebook groups. And there's a lot of them that, for instance, would have their kid one week and then the stepkids the next to yeah. help with any issues they may have had. But also you can't expect them to, quote, quote, blend if they're not around each other. Right. I mean, that schedule, I, I could see the benefits of that, too. That would be nice in our situation, too. What I commonly say with this situation, because my son, you know, he'll compare the two houses, which I think is natural. But he's like, well, the, the kids over there treat me better than the kids over at your house. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah, you have to remember, though, we've been blending for seven years. And You've only been blending over there for seven months. So there's a lot more kind of bad blood or negative memories at my house because we've been together longer. Right. But there's also more positive memories too. We've done more together than they have in seven months. Yeah, still new. Right. They're still in the honeymoon phase. And so my son, he'll kind of play the game where, well... Nobody likes me at your house, so I'm not coming back. And it's like, well, the court order says you need to come back. So you're coming back. And then he comes back and he has a great time. Mm -hmm. And then same thing. Oh, well, I don't want to go back to my dad. Well, (laughs) guess what? The court order says you're going back to your dad. I don't care if you're 14. This is what the court order says. And I'm not going to allow you to pick and play sides. Mm -hmm. So the biological child factor in this whole full time thing has been really a struggle to navigate because he's old enough to manipulate and to know which house is going to be the least resistance. Right. And that's normal to happen, but it's good for you to stand up and say, no, you're going by the court order. Right. And that's the thing we had to realize too, like during the whole COVID quarantine thing. So originally, when we were in quarantine, we ended up kind of following a different, not court order, just kind of what worked for our plan based on who was working and who was home and whatnot. So it ended up being during that quarantine time, my son was staying a month with me and then a month with my ex. Oh, wow. And it was, it was hard. And then that transition period of, you know, him being away for a month and then re-entering our, our blend. You know, nobody wanted to talk to him because he hadn't been around for a month. It, it was awkward. Yeah. How how did you feel about doing that? I mean, you went a month without physically seeing your kid. Yeah. So, I mean, I talked to him on the phone. We FaceTime, all that good stuff. But, I mean, it was tough. And my ex-husband, he doesn't have quite the awesome schedule that I have. He doesn't have the time off that I have. And so he was afforded that time off due to the COVID quarantine. And so it was kind of a gift to him in a way. Well, you never get that kind of time with with our child. So, you know, use it for what it's worth. And so it was actually kind of a positive thing for him, my ex, to have that much interaction with his son. Because normally, even on my off weeks, like I would pick up my son from school, you know, drive him, drop him off at dad's house. So like I normally on an off week would see him every day. So it was just an opportunity for him to spend more time with his biological parent. Mm -hmm. Did your husband have any influence in why you chose to do the month on month off thing? Uh, My current husband? Yes. I, looking back, I don't think so. I mean, 
I ha- my current husband and my biological child have had their share of conflict. But to be honest, my husband was just so caught up in he was really enjoying spending every waking moment with his kids during this time off, which, you know, I get that. So I think he was more concerned about his kid than than anything. Mm -hmm. It sounds so selfish, I know, right? No, I get it. But we see a lot with the whole COVID thing where one parent's like, no, you're not going to send your kid to your ex's house and then them come back here every other week because they might bring germs. We don't know if they're taking it seriously. I mean, this COVID thing has put a lot of stress on blended families. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, there was... I'm more of a germaphobe than my husband, to be honest. So I think it was more me driving that than than anybody else. And even when my son came back, you know, it's not so much like this now, but um, when he would come back, it's like you jump in the shower, you take off your shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are all these kinds of rules that I put into place because let's be honest, I I didn't really trust what they were up to over there. I, I didn't. Right. What would you say your biggest challenge is? I know the food was an issue. I know trying to figure out where to step in as a maternal figure was difficult. Are those your biggest challenges, you would say, in the blend? I Those are some of them. I just think overall, the absent bio mother causes so many other like smaller challenges. So I think she's like the big factor. Which I know I can't control her. Right. And that's something I I have had to learn is I have no control over her, but she has had so much impact on, well, the kids' lives, obviously, my husband's life. But I never would have dreamed that this woman who was uninvolved would have such a big impact on me and the decisions that happen every day, mm-hmm. be it financial, be it, uh, you know, lack of transportation, be it the kids don't have quite the same opportunities as like a two parent household. So I just think that she, she's just caused so many problems by her absence. And when I first entered this situation, it was like, Oh, goody, you know, I don't have to deal with the bio mother. But I do have to deal with her every day. Yes. Even though not not physically or, or not talking to her, but I still have to deal with her every day mm-hmm. because of her lack of involvement. And two, with her not paying child support, if your husband and you have joined finances, that can impact your finances. Yes. So we don't even have joint finances and it still impacts our finances. So we can revisit the food issue. So it's like, who pays for groceries? Well, she didn't pay her child support. So, you know, we're running low on funds. So who pays for the groceries, you know? So, oh yeah, I have definitely had to step up financially as well because of her lack. Mm -hmm. It it is a lot for one person to care for three children solely on his own. So even though we don't have joint finances, it still affects me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Things need to be bought for the kids. Um, one other thing I do for them, and I've done this every year as well, is I buy them their back to school outfit. And that's just kind of my, I, I feel like every kid needs like a fresh, new, fun outfit for the school year. Mm-hmm. And so I do that every year. I take them out shopping and, and they get to pick out something you know, that that's their style and, and I pay for it because I mean, I feel like there's things that moms do for their kids and she obviously doesn't do that. And so that's something I enjoy doing. It's not something I ever want to stop doing. I love seeing them in their pictures with their new outfits. And, and so that makes me happy. But yeah, financially, I, I have to step up all the time because she just doesn't. Yeah. And that's difficult. Now, um, does the court system where you are, do they not go after people for back child support? They do. But here we go again with COVID. So they had a court date right before COVID hit. And so during that court date, I forget how far behind she was at that point. But um, basically, she did not show. And so they put a warrant out for her arrest. Well, maybe a week or two after that, everything was shut down, everything, courts, 
you know, I mean, there's still police, obviously, but right, but they were just not pursuing individuals like her over some money, which I think it's a bigger issue than that. But now here we are, what, a year and a half later, she's paid like a little bit of money. I mean, pennies compared to what she owes. And then I looked it up in the court system the other day, and they're trying to take the warrant, the bench warrant off now. And but she still hasn't paid consistently. So I really don't know what's going on with that. It's it's really hard to get answers out here. But hopefully, I'm hoping this summer that things will kind of kick back up and her free pass disappears. Yeah, definitely. So what would you say is the best piece of advice that you've had regarding blended families? Well, this took me a long time to realize, but especially in my situation, I would take everything personal. Like, you know, they didn't like my cooking. Oh gosh, you know, my feelings are hurt. Oh, they didn't say hi to me when I walked in the door. Oh, I feel so hurt. Mm -hmm. So I really had to realize that it's not about me. Nothing in this is personal. Right. I'm just I'm just doing the best I can in a really difficult situation. And so I don't know how to explain that any better. That's perfect. It's just it's not about me. It's it's about them and what whatever they're dealing with. And I just have to take me out of the equation. Sometimes it's what you represent. You doing things for them could sometimes just be a reminder that their mom's not present. So while they may appreciate what you're doing, it may still hurt them because they're like, I wish my mom was here doing that. Absolutely. And that's been part of the issue with my biological son as well, is they see me doing X, Y, and Z for him. Or, you know, I mean, he gets more presents from me on his birthday because, I mean, he's my child. Mm -hmm. I still buy them presents, but not quite to the same level. Right. And so, you know, they see what I do for for him. And then they a lot of times resent him and and me as well for that. But I I can't control that he's my biological child and they are not. And I just I do for them what I can and what I feel comfortable doing. And, you know, the rest I feel like is up to my husband and and her. Like I I really hope and pray that she figures herself out someday, the biological mother, and she can realize like she has these three great kids off in existence. And I hope she can step up some way somehow in the future. Yeah, I do too. For her sake, for the kids' sake, and for your sake. Yeah, selfishly, I want her to step up for <laughs> for all those reasons and myself included. I mean, that would take a huge stress off. Now, I must mention, and I know we've talked about this before, um, she does what we call resurface every so often. <laughs> and so... <laughs> You know, she'll go like a year or two without any communication. And then she bubbles up, you know, for for her birthday or for Mother's Day or or for whatever reason. And when that happens, it's like all the strides that I've made with our blended family. It's like 15 steps backwards. It's it's really heartbreaking and it's really awful. Yeah. That she has that that kind of impact on them. Mm -hmm. Did they go to counseling or anything? Good question. No. (laughs) No, they do not. And I I've been in counseling since the beginning of this whole blended family thing, but nobody else in my house has gone to counseling. And I I really feel like it would be helpful for them. You know, I I know boys are more resistant to counseling than than girls. But I just, I feel like the absent mom has had such an impact on them. It would help for them to process some of that. Right. I agree 100%. I guess your husband doesn't see the need in that. Yeah. So what's interesting about my husband is he's made some comments that, well, the mom doesn't really affect them all that much. So he thinks that absence equals she's just out of sight, out of mind. Like they don't think about her. uh, She doesn't bother them. None of that. Yeah, we know that's not the case. I know. And I've done a lot of research and reading and and talking to other full-time stepmoms. We all know that, that her absence actually has a larger effect on them than if she were around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of times people don't realize the impact that an absent parent has, whether it's 
by their own choice of being absent or by death, they the kids don't stop longing for that parent regardless. Right. And because she's still in existence, like I almost think it makes it worse. Right. Because she could be there for them. She could pay the money. She could take them to McDonald's. She could do all these things, but she's not. So that's all the more painful. And then the fact that she's around taking care of three other kids. Well, why is she able to do that for them? But she can't do anything for me. It's, yeah. it's really baffling this situation. Well, and it's almost like adopted children. So for instance, say a lady has three kids and she gives the middle one up for adoption for whatever reason. And then when the kid finds out they're adopted, they're like, why was it me? Why can she raise these other two kids, but why couldn't she raise me? It's almost like the kids can view it as something was wrong with them or they weren't chosen. Right. I like that phrase, chosen. You know, they feel like not the chosen ones. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I would support counseling. But again, it's that my husband's decision. And so, you know, I have to bite my tongue and close my mouth and just let it go that, all right, you know, you think that there's not an impact and they don't need professional therapy. So um, that's, that's your decision. But if things ever get tough, one, I've told the kids, if you ever, if you ever decide you would like therapy, I will support that. Mm -hmm. Um, But two, if things get tough, that's on him. Nobody can fault me for, well, you didn't allow us to do this or you never spoke up. Right. I just removed myself from, from larger decisions like that. And, you know, where the pieces fall, that's, that's what happens, but it's, it's not on me. It's, it's on the mother. And that's what I've had to realize too. Like this is, this is all her doing, not my doing. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do is be there for them. If they reach out to you. Not to try to push that relationship, but to allow them to direct it or to drive it. That's exactly what I've had to do. And so, you know, a stepdaughter recently said something about therapy. I don't know if we saw it on a TV show or what. And I think she mentioned like, oh, I have a friend that goes to therapy. And and I opened up to her. I said, hey, guess what? I go to therapy too. And and that's okay. And And if you ever feel like you would like to talk to someone, I I have a number for you. So all you have to do is reach out. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That is so great. So out of all of your three step kids, which relationship would you say is the most difficult? Oh, gosh. (laughs) This is a tricky question because I feel like it changes from day to day, month to month, year to year. It's true. It does. That's I was hoping that was going to be your answer (laughs) because it does. It shifts. Yes, it does. I mean, I think if I look overall, like globally over the seven years, I would have to say it was the stepdaughter. A lot of reasons for that. So she is the only other female in the house. And so I think that's just naturally competitive. And and she is the oldest of the pack too. So she's more of a, a born leader and, and very responsible. And, and I think essentially she took over the motherhood roles when mom left, even though she was like six or seven. So when I came around, I, I think she felt like she was being replaced as, as daddy's special girl. Mm-hmm. And I think we've had some issues where it kind of felt like she wanted to kind of be viewed the same way that I was like as a wife, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, where she wanted to be loved in the same manner that, that I would love, but I, I hope that she's learned over time that there's a difference between a, a daddy's love and a husband's love. And, and, you know, I, I hope that for her future relationships as well is that she, she knows the difference because her stepping up, I mean, in my opinion, completely inappropriate to expect a six or seven year old to take on motherhood roles. Um, so I, I just hope she can find healthy relationships in the future. Yeah. But most challenging now. Mm -hmm. So her and I have kind of found some ways to bond and connect. And uh, you gave me some helpful ideas on that. So we've been painting nails and finding stuff on Netflix that we, us and only us enjoy, you know, those girly movies like Legally Blonde and things like that. Uh Um, So we've found lots of ways to connect. So 
currently, that's probably my strongest step relationship in the house. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness, because um, just an interesting kind of side story. So it was just Mother's Day a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And the kids generally don't honor me, which is fine. And I understand and that Mother's Day is really painful for them because it's a reminder that mom's not around. Right. Well, she uh, homemade a card for me and printed pictures. She has like a little photo printer. She printed these pictures of like me with different members of the family and like wrote a sweet little message and, and presented it to me on Mother's Day. And it was like really emotional because she, well, none of them like really honor me in that way. And it was completely unexpected. And I was like, wow, this is really touching, like that she thought of me today. She's like, oh, of course I think of you today, <laughs> you know? So, oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. So, and, and they don't call me mom and, and that's okay. Like, I don't, I don't want that role. I don't want them to call me that. I'm happy with the role I have. <laughs> so that was really touching. But uh, currently the most difficult relationship I have is with the youngest stepson. And I... He's, he's a very, how do I put this kindly? He's like a very hardened individual. Mm -hmm. So he has trouble like communicating appreciation for anybody that does anything nice for him. You know, like he just, I, I think communicating in general is just not his strong suit. Right. And so even if I talk to him or address him in any way, like, of course, only positive, he just he he doesn't let people in. Mm -hmm. He he's just not that like you know warm and fuzzy kind of person. Well, he's probably got his wall up, and it probably has a lot to do with his bio mom. Oh, and I know that one thousand mm -hmm. percent. So, and he was actually abandoned when he was one. I mean, so he'll make comments like, "Well, I don't even know that woman. You know, I don't care about her." Oh my gosh! And. It's like, it's difficult to hear him say that because, I mean, I know the truth behind it, but, you know, he's just completely cut off from that, all of that. I would think out of all of them, he would need more counseling or therapy more than the others because of that situation. I agree with that so much. Yeah, he's got his wall up. He doesn't want to get attached to somebody and them hurting. Right. And I, I try to reassure them like, okay, like I'm not going anywhere. So, you know, we're going to work this out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's hard. I think they appreciate that, but then they also don't like that too, you know, <laughs> but I, it's the truth. Like I'm not going anywhere. This is why I joined the Nacho Kids Academy. I, I want this to work. I, I love my husband. We have, you know, so many good memories. It's just the blend has been challenging. And so I'm not going anywhere for them, even if they don't talk to me, even if they you know, don't thank me for dinner. I'm, I'm over all of that. Right. You've come a long way. You've definitely come a long way. Yes. I, I've been a member of the Nacho Kids Academy for almost a year now. And I mean, I can tell a difference even, even just with me. I had to take control of what I can control mm -hmm. and let go of what I can't. And I just feel so much more at peace doing what I'm doing than doing what I was doing before. And you can hear it in your voice. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> you can, because I remember the first time that we talked to you, you just sounded exhausted and just like you didn't know what to do, but something had to give. Exactly. I've noticed over time that, of course, is things have changed. But talking to you today, it reminded me of the first time that we talked to you. And I'm like, I can hear the difference. That stress, not that there's not any stress, but the stress that was there in the beginning is not there anymore. Right. And and when I first talked to you guys, too, it was like the, the kids were gone uh, for a small period of time. They were on a, a vacation. And I just could not picture them coming back. Like, how am I going to survive them re-entering my house? I've had five weeks of just me and peace and quiet and clean and, and all those things that we desire for some of us as stepmoms. And so, I mean, I was just desperate at that point. And I have to be honest, though, and, and I hope this doesn't deter anyone, but I mean, it's taken me almost a year of healing and, and making peace with things to get to the place where I'm at now, where it's just so much better. Well, you know, with our situation, it took me a year before I started reengaging with the stepkids because we had to heal from that hurt. 
not just me, but them also. It takes time. You can't take a year or two years or even three years worth of hurt and expect it to be healed quickly. I kind of liken it to when you have a baby, your insides, they say it takes like, what, seven years or something crazy for them to go back to where they're supposed to be after you have a baby. So you, yeah. you can't expect things to just change instantly. Not that things don't sometimes, like the pressure when I started not joining was released immediately, but that doesn't mean that we resolved the issues. I still had to work on that, but definitely the pressure was released in the beginning quickly, but it takes time. And I know several people that they've been in the academy and three months, they're good. I know other people a year and they're where you are, or they're like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm finally getting it. I'm finally getting it. And we've also got another lady that she's like, I will be a lifetime member. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that might be me for a while. <laughs> yeah. She said, it's a way of life for me. It's not just with the blend, but it's a way of life for her, which I agree it is for me too. But I don't think that's deterring anybody. I think it's being realistic that some people can join the academy and get what they need out of it to, quote, quote, fix their issues or better their blend quicker than others. But it depends on how deep in the trenches you are. Right. And you were pretty deep. I was pretty deep, especially, I mean, not to say that other people's situations aren't more serious. I've listened to enough podcasts. I'm like, wow, I could never deal with that. Or, you know, there's different things that I've never thought of. But uh, being a full timer, man, it. It's not for the faint of heart. It presents its own challenges. And, and I think that that's been my main thing that's caused me to be in so deep is, you know, I was gung ho in the beginning, super stepmom, mm -hmm. everything, you know, doing everything, the schooling, the driving, the cooking, the cleaning, the paying for stuff. It, it, it was, it was awful. And it took me what, six years, you know, I had listened to the Nacho Kids podcast since it came out, like since episode one, mm -hmm. but it, it took me six years to really start getting my feet wet with all of this. And I am so glad that I did because I, I don't think, I honestly don't think I would have stuck it out to year seven had I not found you guys and, and jumped on the calls and been in the forums and been active. I, I really don't. Yeah. And I'm so glad you found us, but you've got a good point. Even if you join, you've got to put the work in or it's not going to work. Exactly. And that's something I had to realize too. Like my husband, I, I love him dearly, but his focus is on raising three kids practically single. So he wasn't going to put in like a ton of work. You know, kids are kids, so I can't expect them to change. Mm -hmm. You know, my son's back and forth and he's not responsible for, for my happiness. So guess what? That leaves me with me. And so I realized I had to put in the work, I had to do the hard things and have the tough conversations and make changes within myself and my attitude and, and just what I was doing or not doing around the house. And, and it worked. It, it was very helpful to just look inward instead of pointing the finger at everybody else. Yeah. And it's not that we're beating ourselves up or blaming ourselves for everything, but we don't seem to realize a lot of times the impact we have on things. So that makes me wonder something about you. So if I can ask a question okay, about re-engagement. Did you re-engage with all, you have what, four stepkids? Uh-huh, four stepsons. Um, did you re-engage with them all like at the similar time or was it kind of a, a trickle effect or, or how did that work out for you? It was different for each one based on where I felt they were ready to. So for instance, David's oldest, Avery, he's he's kind of withdrawn. He always has been. So my re-engagement with him was only slight. It was completely different than it is with the triplets. And with the triplets, you know, there was one triplet that was the leader of the pack of Burn Laurie at the stake. I re-engaged with him more slowly because he did have more of that hurt to overcome than the others. But I would say... I'm probably closer to him than I am the others now. Yeah, that's that's really interesting for me because, you know, I'm looking at re-engaging with three. Mm -hmm. And so stepdaughter, we're, we're already in the process. That's, that's come full circle. And so then it's the, the two boys. 
And so, yeah, I, I was just wondering how that looked for you. Yeah, I would say um, it's it's still different. It's, I can't say, oh, I've reengaged 90% with all of them. One of them is best for me, one of the triplets. I just don't have as much contact with him, even though he's closer to us. But when I see him, everything's great. We hug each other. We tell each other we love each other. He sent me a happy Mother's Day text. But he's one of those that I can't get it too involved with his life because I want more for him than he wants for himself. Right. And that's one of the... <laughs> That's one of the rules, isn't it? Like, Mm -hmm. we we can't. Well, you can't care more than the bio parent, but heck, when the kids are adults, you can't care more than they do. Exactly. And we're coming up on that pretty soon in our house. You know, we'll we'll have an 18-year-old by the end of this year. Yes. And I was going to tell you, the hardest relationship in a blend is the stepmom and a stepdaughter. So remind yourself of that when you realize how far you've come. Yes, and I'm aware of that. And so, I mean, I do the victory dance almost every day that that I have a positive interaction with her. So, and and the fact that she's the first one that that I'm having like really good successful reengagement with, that's huge. Mm-hmm. That is huge. That is definitely huge. And I'm so proud of you. And I'm so happy for you because you did put in the effort in the academy, and you did work the tools and work the process and you made this happen. Yes, I'll take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Yeah, my, but kudos to you guys too. Like, it's a fantastic method for you know those who need it. I know not everybody needs it, but um, for people like me, especially full time situation, I'm going to say it again. These tools are are so necessary because I mean I feel like it is easier to burn out when you never get a break and then you're always feeling like you're beating your head against a wall and you feel like you're responsible for so much. Mm -hmm. Guess what? All that responsibility was, a lot of it was in my mind. Like I had to realize I was not responsible for that. Like how did, how did I ever think that? Well, it's like me that day that, you know, the clouds parted and the rays from heaven came down and I realized they were not my kids, which I knew, but it just came to me in a different way. When I realized I was creating my own misery, it was just like, oh, I'm doing this to myself. And a lot of times we do because we want so bad to fix what we didn't break and to make things perfect. Oh, girl, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So that that hits home for me. <laughs> I, I wanted everything to be perfect. You know, we, this was a marriage 23 years in the making and I wanted it to be perfect and I wanted everyone to like me in the house and I wanted to do good for everyone, especially since there was someone out there not doing good for them. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a savior by any means. I know I'm just doing the best I can. Yes. And I love that phrase, recovering perfectionist. <laughs> that is me. Totally. I, I have to work on it daily. I'm right there with you because one of my hardest things when I moved in with the stepkids and David was the the mess. I mean, they would come in from school, take their shoes off and throw their book bags down. Oh my gosh, it looked like a shoe store. And it drove me nuts. But I got over it because I realized it was more important for me to have a relationship with those stepkids than for me to have the shoes picked up off the floor every day. Girl, I am right there with you. My family room looks like a laundry room. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are... There's one child in particular, which we will leave out of this, <laughs> that um, changes clothes out there, like right in front of the TV, like just and leaves the dirty <laughs> clothes all over the place. Uh huh. And um, they, it's still going on to this day. But same as you, I had to really accept that. And what I did, I mean, I, I agree that the relationship is more important. But what I did was we have a loft upstairs and so I was like okay well I'll put the, another tv up there and I'll make it my space and so if I want to watch tv I just go in the loft and and everybody knows where to find me mm-hmm. so that's kind of how I nachoed that was like all right I'm not going to get on you about the clothes laying everywhere but I'm also not going to sit out here and look at it so right and a lot of people say well what do you do just let them junk up your house and you live in filth no If it bothers you that much, your options are ask your husband or significant other to pick it up or you pick it up yourself. 
No grumbling if you pick it up yourself. Right. That's that's what I've had to learn too. Like, okay, I cannot slam the dishes in the cupboard <laughs> because I'm mad that nobody else helps me with the dishes. <laughs> Girl, I'm surprised sometimes that this house stayed on its foundation as many times as I slammed those cabinets. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, those are the easiest things. Or, you know, I vacuum the heck out of the carpet. I'll tell you what, when I'm upset, that's my go to stress relief. Just vacuum the crap out of the carpet. Mm -hmm. And see, David knows if I'm mad, I clean. So that's why he enjoys pushing my button so much. (laughs) I'll be like, oh, the closet needs cleaning out. Let me push Lori's buttons. Oh, I wish my husband had that same strategy. I I am a, an angry cleaner. No, you don't. Don't ever <laughs> wish for a button pushing husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just I need an excuse to to clean because I mean the mess does drive me crazy. Don't get me wrong, like perfectionist OCD right here. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I've ha- I've had to find new ways to cope with all of that. So. Yeah, my my husband, he's just a different breed. He he could care less if the closet is filled with junk. Uh, He could care less if the carpet hasn't been vacuumed in 10 weeks. (laughs) Yeah. So so that's why I say I I wish he would push my buttons to to get my patootie in gear. (laughs) (laughs) The house would be cleaner. Like it's the end of the school year. So I'm, I'm pretty exhausted with school responsibilities. And so I've given up a lot of the house responsibilities. And guess what? Hasn't gotten done by anyone. And I just, I don't care at this point. When summer hits, I'll I'll figure it out. Well, that's what I was going to say is you're getting ready to have a couple of months to clean. Yes. And the the kids are, are going on their annual vacation. And so that is the best time to clean because it will not be messed up within 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. Do they go on vacation with family? Uh, yes. So we have family out of town and they it's their grandparents. So they have them stay with them for uh, anywhere between four to six weeks. Girl, party at your house. I know. And last year it was like not even going to happen because of COVID. Here we go again. Uh And, um, and I was like, well, surely there's a way, honey. Like (laughs) they weren't willing to fly on an airplane and and their grandparents are elderly. So it was like kind of a risky thing. And I was like, well, why don't y'all just uh, rent a car and and drive across the country. And so that's what they did. So so I got my break last year too. Good. At least you're getting that break. I know you're not getting the every other week or every other weekend break that a lot of us do or did, but you are getting that break. So you enjoy every single day of it. Oh, you know, I will. I, I actually signed up to work overtime because it's like really good pay. Yeah. So um, the first week my husband's gone and He's like, oh, you could come with me and and stay for a week. And I was like, oh, no, thanks. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I signed up to work overtime, hang out with the dog. And and I have some, you know, lunch dates with friends. So, I mean, life is really opening back up for us. And, and so I just wanted that opportunity for myself for a week to just Just be me and do me and whatever else comes along with being home alone. There you go. Netflix binges and bonbons and just chill. That all sounds wonderful. Well, Adrian, it has been great having you as a guest on our podcast. Thank you so much, Lori. I loved being a guest. And anytime you want to hear from a full-time stepmom, I'm your girl. Well, we definitely want to have you back and see how things are going, you know, in a year or so. Yep, I'll still be around on the uh, Academy, and I'm ready and willing to help whenever. (laughs) Sounds good. Well, thank you again, and you have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Adrian. I did. You weren't there. (laughs) But I listened. Okay. All right, if you listened. (laughs) Oh, gosh, here we go. Never mind. (laughs) One of the things that... I want to bring up that we talk about, and this is not the first time we've talked about it, is step parents that are teachers and how it's so hard for them to not be in teacher mode when they get home. Mm -hmm. Teachers and and sport coaches. Or in therapists, because they're like, I I tell people all day long how to deal with this crap, but I can't even deal with it at my house. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a number of those. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's when it's, when it's your, mess to deal with, it's different. Mm -hmm. Well, it also speaks to when you get 
feedback from other people, you have to really consider that what they're, if they're telling you to do something versus leading you to coming up with your own solution, but if they're telling you to do something, I would do blah, 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 but they're not in the situation. And, you know, honestly, I think there has been a scientific study on this, even though I'd have to find it, but people will do things differently in a situation than what they tell you to do in the same situation or similar oh, situation. Yeah. yeah. So keep that in mind when somebody's like, oh, if I was your blah, blah, blah. You really have to kind of think that through because they're speaking from a point of this does not affect them. Mm -hmm. Neither will what you decide to do affect them. So just keep that in mind when you're getting feedback from other people. Exactly. All right. That's all I got to talk about today. All right, folks, that has been our show for today. Be sure to join us next week as we have another exciting episode from the Nacho Kids. Remember, for Lori and myself, that life is good. And you, Nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.